punched the trains on time, pulling in just as I reached the station. Furtively throwing futile glances back into the impenetrable whiteness for any sign of pursuit, I went off to the side of the double doors for the train to discharge its few passengers. Standing up as an effort, a professionally dressed, moderately pretty woman looks up in passing and gives me a startled glance as she readjusts the bag on her shoulder. I must look like a wreck. The sickly smile I return only seems to disturb her more. I enter the car and fall onto the hard plastic benches facing the rear of the train, roughly dropping my valet next to me. As the train pulls out of the station, I heave a sigh of relief. Whatever that thing was, I seem to have managed to outrun it so far. If my luck holds, I'll be able to get home to my apartment and retrieve some firepower more substantial than the Glock. The heavy weight of my .50 caliber pistol would feel remarkably comfortable right now, as would my semi-automatic shotgun with the 12 gauge, double out. The real question in my mind is what the hell was this thing? Granted, it wasn't the first otherworldly entity that I've seen in my life, but a large part of me still wants to put that last time down to trauma-based hallucination. Besides, this one was physically different. Though the strange feeling of unreality is absolutely the same. I've never heard of anything like this creature outside comic books and fairy tales. The odds that one man would randomly encounter more than one of these things in a single lifetime have to be astronomical. Therefore, logic suggests there must be some connection between the two meetings. But what? The lights flicker. I look around the compartment and notice I almost have it all to myself. In fact, the only company I have is a homeless man I somehow didn't see when I first got on, sprawled unconscious across the bench towards the rear. I can't blame him for wanting to get out of the storm, but I briefly wonder how he's managed to avoid the conductor since he doesn't like he would be able to afford a ticket, or even half a ticket. I pull my monthly ride pass from my inner coat pocket and place it into the plastic slot on the back of the seat in front of me. My shoulder sharply throbs, causing me to look up. The first thing I notice is that my formerly sleeping homeless companion is wide awake and sitting at rigid attention. The next is that his eyes are fixed in an unblinking stare directly at me. They are remarkably bloodshot. So red that they bear a disconcertingly close resemblance to the eyes of the creature that was pursuing me earlier. The man slowly stands, his unwavering gaze attempting to bore straight through me. I return his stare, matching the steadiness, if not the intensity given by the preternatural color of his eyes. I can feel the tiny hairs on the back of my neck stand erect, and a rash of goosebumps flush down my arms. I find myself mentally reviewing years of close combat training as my hand, almost on its own accord, slowly edges down towards my right ankle and the tiny glock concealed there. I take stock of the man twenty-five feet down the car from me. On the surface, other than his startling eyes, there is nothing that would make him stand out in a room full of derelicts. He stands about five-seven, with an average build and looks to be in his mid to late sixties. His grey hair is as long and matted as the snarling beard that practically explodes out of his lower face. He's wearing grey sweatpants and trashed sneakers. His toes showing through a sizable hole in one of them. A dark ready fleece hat on his head, he's bundled in an old Vietnam era army issue jacket. And I briefly pause in my assessment to wonder if he's a veteran. He is carrying no obvious weapons I can see. But I know many ways for the average person to conceal any number of blades, pistols, and other violence-inducing implements. Many more of that person's clever. Still, with those eyes, that'd be one hell of a coincidence if the two weren't somehow related. I grab my shoulder, grimacing as the white-hot pain lances through it and brings stars into my eyes. Regaining my awareness, I realize that the man has moved the complete length of the train car impossibly fast and now looms directly over me. Before I can think, much less begin to clear the gun from its holster, 
His hand flushes down and traps my wrist in an iron grip. A crazy sneering grin on his face. The man's other hand seizes my left shoulder and pins me to the back of my seat, the whole movement taking no more than a fraction of a second. With his face mere inches from my own, it's nauseatingly obvious that he hasn't bathed in some time. Dirt and other substances, whose identity I fear to guess, are smeared indiscriminately over his skin and clothing alike. Several gigantic flies flit out, buzzing continuously and occasionally pausing to alight on his face, hands, and elsewhere. A sickening cocktail odor of sweat, ammonia, and something sulfurous permeates the air around him as his breath weaves in and out of his mouth through excessively crooked teeth the color of jaundice. I notice that several are missing. I also note that those remaining have been filed into wicked points that look sharp enough to shred skin and tissue like so much wet toilet paper. This close to them, his eyes aren't merely bloodshot, but glowing. Their unfaltering scrutiny becomes an indefensible onslaught. I feel as if my consciousness is being forcibly drawn into some blasphemous other world through a blood-red portal. For a second, I see myself struggling, drowning in molten fire that snaps and swirls where his iris is should be. Growing to the point, not the smallest speck of white is visible in his eyes. Realization hits me like a thunderbolt. God, he and that monster aren't connected. They're the same fucking thing. In the back of my mind, a deeply buried primal instinct tells me that at this moment, something is profoundly wrong with the world. The presence of this unknown entity whose very being mocks the laws of reason, a living nightmare that has escaped the realm of sleep. The most unnerving part is that I've felt this way countless times before. Once three years ago in a dank underground cavern in the middle of a war zone, and every night since while suffering those horrifyingly real dreams of the impossible things my eyes tell me they saw there. A long black tongue, feeling like rough leather, licks the dried blood from my scalp. I sit completely still, shocked beyond movement, mouth slightly ajar. Mm. Yes, this the one. This the one is him. The man thing mumbles. I gape up at him. Still not right now. Not right. Supposed to be as it. Doesn't be as it. No, 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 being has it. Not supposed to be. Where is it being? A little soldier boy. Where is it being hiding at? Hiding? I somehow found my voice. I, I think... Uh, I think you must have the wrong man, sir. I'm not hiding anything. I'm just the school teacher. I, I teach history in Haverbrook. Some incredibly small part of my brain mentally chastises the rest of my consciousness, which is currently in the process of wetting itself to stop being such a silly, helpless little bitch. And I used to call myself a soldier? No wonder I didn't make it all the way through to retirement. <laughs> Little soldier boy thing he's being teacher. Being teacher of little children. Teaching histories, he thinking. <laughs> the man thing giggles. Bill's annoying saying that those who can do, those who can't teach. What you can do, little soldier boy. Little soldier boy you can do, and little soldier boy will do if the least would let soldier boy do. Teaching of histories thinks you teaching. <laughs> <laughs>
Histories of men, but not histories. Naughty right histories. The little folk of I not want to teach them. Little soldier boy, one to being doing things. The little soldier boy being doing, his beers being letting him. But beers not supposed to be letting him. No. Big Beal's not sure if Beal's supposed to not be letting him, if Soldier Boy not being has it. Mm. Little Soldier Boy the one supposed to be having it. But something being wrong. Supposed to be here. But being here not. Where being it, little soldier boy? A small angry spark seems to flare in my mind, and I manage to offer up at least the pretense of resistance. I've always hated it when people get in my face. Probably why I had such a tough time at basic training. The non-pants wedding part of my brain gives a tiny cheer. Frankly, Beals, or whatever the fuck your name is, I glare at him with what I hope is significantly more confidence than I actually feel. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now get your damn hands off me! My anger only seems to amuse him. <laughs> damned hands, yes. Damned hands, damned arms, damned beers. The dirt-smeared, leathery skin of his face crinkles around the flaming pools following in place of his eyes as he laughs. Little soldier boy knows more than he thinks he knows he does. But no. Little soldier boy not knows what little soldier boy is supposed to know he does not. What Bill's to do? We are supposed to be finding little soldier boy. Finding little soldier boy Bill's has. What little soldier boy is supposed to be has it? The man thing's mouth closes in a hard line as he contemplates this dilemma. I will admit his issue has me completely confounded as well, but for entirely different reasons. Suddenly his face lights, red eyes shining even brighter like two miniature stars that found themselves trapped within a prison of flesh and bone. The same wicked smile again stretches across his mottled lips, razor-like teeth seeming to glint in the harsh electric light of the train car. <sighs> but little soldier boy already mocked by Dark One, yes, mocked. And so Beals can find again. Find again, Beals can, little soldier boys, mark from Dark One. And then Beals can make sure little soldier boy not doing little soldier boy things. Gripping my arm and shoulder, the man thing pulls me in even closer and hisses in my ear. <sighs> You belong to Dark Ones now, little soldier boy. Once your being has what you supposed to be has, Dark Ones being taking what belonging to them. He abruptly releases my arm, shoving me back painfully hard against the unforgiving seat. The instant I'm free, I move to snatch the Glock from my ankle. Jump to my feet and snap into a two-handed shooter stance, slightly dazed. I find myself alone in the train car. The creature pretending to be an old man is gone. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. 
And if you're an animal lover like me, please consider donating to the World Land Trust, a charity that aims to help wildlife through buying land, preventing development, and helping endangered species.